Dickie, uh, uh, Dickie, as long as you're up, you can uh, uh, get me a Grants, Dickie, as long as you're up. I'll just finish off this chapter here, and I'll round off this sonnet here, old man, and as long as you're up, just pick me up a Grants there. <laughs> Sometimes, Dickie, you know, I hear, I just hear things that I can't express running through my mind. There are some things that the human voice and the human pen, you know, I've been writing for a long time. There's just some things that one can't say. They just there's there's something running through my soul. Is, I suppose you call it the eternal inexpressible, Dick. Actually, oh, by the way, Dick, I'd like a Grant's on the rocks, please. Well, but uh, it's the inexpressible is what I'm trying to say. It's that that great well of well, I suppose you might say vital life force. Day, I was talking to Bobby uh, down at the shop, and I, I said, Bobby, by God, Bobby, there's something about being alive and looking at the sun and feeling that air and the beach and all that that I just can't put into words. And you know, Bobby cried. He just cried. He just cried and cried. That's all right. We don't need it anymore, son. He just cried and cried. Well, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's there. There's a moon hanging out there. And, uh, I would suggest, uh, that you look at it. It's live. It's not exactly in stereo. And it doesn't have a frame, you know. That's the sad thing about it. That we're, we're so used to things in frames today. That, that, if, if, if Moses were really on the ball, I'm talking about Robert Moses. Hard to tell one Moses from the other, though, in these days, the big pronouncements going on. But uh, if Moses were on the ball, Moses would see to it that New York is better produced, that there, that there was care shown, honest consideration for what we... We were just... Look, let's, let's face it. We're just people. We're walking around scratching, see, and, and, and we have a lot of things inside of us that hardly any of us will admit to ever, you know? <laughs> well, now I'll give you ten seconds to think of something inside of you that you won't admit to. All right, cut it out. Now, we don't want any supplication here. We don't need any of that. We don't need anybody down on his knees or with a tom-tom. Although that's there, too, I'm, I'm sure, you know. There's no question about it, because... Everywhere you look, you know, you know, you, you have the feeling that other people are having more passion than you are. Have you ever, have you ever, say, say reading Durrell, have you ever felt that, that Durrell is obviously far more passionate than you are? That he, 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 oh yes, of course. Now, now I wonder whether Durrell really is or whether Durrell writes himself up well. That's a hard question. You can do a lot with words, you know. And, but then, on the other hand, it, it, does, does Durrell believe he is that way? Now, I may be talking about somebody you never heard of, but then, on the other hand, let's take somebody you have heard of. Well, I don't know. It doesn't matter one way or the other. We are continually being dogged that we're being nipped. The hounds of hell are nipping at our hocks, saying in one way or another, you are not sentimental enough. You don't cry enough at, at funerals. You don't certainly don't ever get as 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 involved in the Middle Eastern situation as, say, Edward R. Murrow does. Do you remember when Murrow used to look out there at you, and you could just see those great big eyes and that fantastic cloud of smoke, and you could just feel that 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 vibrating energy about Beirut and the condition of the people there. You remember? And you'd sit out there with your can of beer and your mitt. Yeah, well, all right, let's face it, you know. I mean, you know, let's face it. We are, we are inadequate. I mean, inadequate, let's say, uh, sensitivity-wise, if I may use a phrase, uh, of a Madison Avenue ilk. Well, I'm here tonight to tell you 
that I know that inside of me is a gigantic cesspool, a boiling swamp of romanticism and sentimentality, which every waking hour of the day I strive to cover over. Oh, seriously. I'm just telling you, that's one good thing about being on the radio. Nobody can see you. You don't get embarrassed. You can, <laughs> and, and you can say stuff that you could never say in the living room. You know, I couldn't get up in front of these, these clowns I know, these guys with the beards, and the guys are beating the banjos and yelling, oh, that's my job. you know, yelling and hollering these guys. And I couldn't get up and say, look, I, I'll tell you that inside of me is a lake of sentimentality. It's veritably a swamp. It's got, it's got lily pads growing on it. It really has, and it has. It, it doesn't have. It has, doesn't have water lilies. It has lotus blossoms. Well, actually, these. Are, uh, what is the? Uh, what is the plural of the lotus? Loti, I presume. But it has these. These blossoms floating, and it's always. It's always in the middle distance of light. It's never really quite twilight. It's never quite dawn. <laughs> And it's kind of hazy, you know. Get my sentimental music up there, please. That is not what you've got. That's that's it right there. You just get it up there. Because the now is the time. That that there are other things too about this this gigantic body of water of sentimentality in me. That once in a while I will tap it. I will, it'll open up and I'm very embarrassed. I don't know what to do. You know, it's, it's terrible. You find yourself swallowing. You know what I mean? You're, you're swallowing emotionally for no reason other than the fact that what has been said is real or it seems to be real. And I'm going to tell you a story that has to do with how guys learn to be hardened and grizzled. Now, all of us, now, there's one thing about being abstractly sentimental about great issues. Now, that's what we specialize in today. Uh, we specialized in being very concerned over an abstraction that has nothing whatsoever to do with our lives. You know? Like, everyone can go and weep over Geraldine Page. Well, you know, so you don't you know Geraldine Page. You're weeping over Tennessee Williams. You don't even know Tennessee Williams. What do you call a guy like Tennessee Williams when you're being palsy with him? You know, Tan? Or what do you call him? Memphis or what, you know? Or what is his nickname? What is the nickname of a guy named Tennessee? I don't know. You know? But the point is... You're being sentimental over an abstraction. You read a novel and you weep. Hardly anybody ever weeps over other people or uh, things that they can see. They will weep like mad over a poem. Uh, this is a very, very difficult thing to concern yourself with. Well, I'll remember one day forever and ever, and I, I'll tell you why it is. I think we've learned. We've learned that you're very vulnerable when you weep. Very vulnerable. I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm a kid, see. Uh, I don't like to, I don't like to bring, this has nothing to do with nostalgia. It has to do with the then and the now. It has to do with the A and the Z, the alpha and the omega of existence. And one thing about kids, they have not learned the game yet. That's the only thing that really stands between a kid and his old man. The old man has learned to play the game, whatever the game happens to be in the neighborhood. He plays it, he plays it well. Now, generally, the old man will 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 be very bugged if somebody in the neighborhood does not play the game. We refer to that guy as being immature, the non-game player. Now, also, the non-game player will feel that because he is not playing the game, he is more honest than the guy who is playing the game. This is a questionable thesis. Playing a game or not playing has very little to do with honesty. It often has to do with good reflexes. Like a good game player maybe can throw a good forward pass, you know. He can, he's quick around his feet. But I say that most non-game players in the neighborhood have tried but failed. Uh, many are chosen, few are called, or vice versa. Each one of us wants to be Babbitt, but we usually wind up sore, making the scene on the Cougar Street, and not quite doing it. Very hard. Well, one time I'm this kid, see. And I'm in the band. Actually, I'm in the orchestra. Now, there is no better place of education. Now, if, you, if you've got a kid and you want your kid to learn about life, you really do want him to learn something about life. Get this kid in the orchestra. 
I think the greatest single thing that I ever learned in high school, I can, I can think of all the courses, I can hardly remember them. I can hardly remember civics too, you know. I can't remember physics 303. I can't remember it. It all just blends into one big thing, high school, you know, classes. And, and I can hardly point to one thing and say, yes, this did it, this did it, this did it. But let me tell you, anybody who's ever been in the band or the orchestra, that sets up over here to the left somewhere very special. It's the band and the orchestra. Because it does not relate to the kind of jazz you learn in school, which is purely abstract. Purely abstract. I mean, so so a kid is reading about civics. You know, what what does he know about the city hall? What does he know about what, what does he know about bathhouse, John? You know, what does he know about 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 Carmine de Sapio? He's reading civics. Nothing to do with it. You know, uh, put him down there in the in the smoke filled room and send him off for cokes for a couple of weeks. He learn a lot about civics very very fast. Well, the band literally is being sent out for cokes because when you're dealing with in the orchestra particularly. You are dealing with something that none of the other kids ever deal with. Have you ever, have you ever noticed the kind of literature kids read in high school? Well, I don't know of one book that a kid reads in high school as required reading that has any of the same statement or has anything to do with anything even remotely comparable to say, uh, Beethoven's Six. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you this, it's a funny business. When you're, when you're 14 years old and you find yourself deeply entangled in Wagner. Woo! Oh yeah, I mean, and, and you know something's going and you don't know quite what it is. It's like somebody's mixing marijuana with the Wheaties. You quite can't figure it out. All you know is your eyeballs are bugging out once in a while and your ears are humming and, you, and you're seeing things that nobody else is seeing, but you can't understand them. A kid immersed in Beethoven. Is, is, he's really in a swamp. I'll tell you. Cause Beethoven was not a 12 year old, uh, Excalibur. He wasn't a, he wasn't a 12 year old genius. <laughs> he knew what he was saying. Well, I'm this kid now, you gotta understand, and I'm, I'm, I come from a house where our deepest form of music, uh, speaking of deep things and dismal swamps, this is W-O-R-A-M at FM, New York. Uh, this is more truth there than fiction. But, uh, I come from this kind of house, you know, where the deepest thought is the old man getting mad because Aunt Teresa is reading the, the obits. That's a deep thought. Or, 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 or a genuine crisis is when Luke Appling sprains his ankle and is out of the White Sox lineup for 10 days. You know, that kind of thing. That was a real moral crisis. Uh, you know, all kinds of little things. But nothing, no one ever believe. no one ever thinks in a certain, you know that in a certain level of American life, and I have to say American life because I am an American, so I don't know about life in France that well, but a whole area of Americans, a whole raft of Americans, do not really go much beyond that kind of surface existence. They really don't. Their biggest problem is whether the Yankees are going to take the pennant. Uh, whether they're going to get a raise. Well, now, I'm not so sure Beethoven was talking about the Yankees, you know, and, I, and he didn't seem to be concerned about getting the raise. It was a whole entirely new set of values, and what they were, I couldn't comprehend what it was all about. I didn't know what it was, but let me tell you how it happened one day. We are working away. I'm in the orchestra scene. I'm, I'm a string bass player. Now, a string bass player, because of the nature of playing the string bass, he is given a more objective view of the orchestra than other people. One, he's standing up. Now, not many people stand up in the orchestra, the timpani player. He, too, is objective. He's a real outsider. He has about five minutes of business in a, in a whole four-hour concert. You know, so he's a true outsider. Uh, there are a few people in an orchestra that are outsiders. The, the, the string bass player, the timpani player, the trap drummer, who is usually also the timpani man. He's very outside. The harpist. Harpist is never part of the orchestra. You may see that chick sitting down there, and she looks like she isn't. Not at all. They don't even consider that. Even in the orchestra, they don't. They put her down all kinds of ways, you know. <laughs> the harpist. And, and she has about three notes. Uh, they'll play one Dvorak thing. She has a couple of big moments, and that's about it, you know. Well, I'm a, I'm a string bass player. And we have been working now for a solid year on things like, uh, oh, you know, little little orchestral pieces that are written for high school orchestras. And around about the end of the semester, just about June, old man Dirk says, we're now ready. You see, he's, he's got the orchestra rounded into shape. We're now ready to work on some real stuff. 
the real stuff. And they pass out the music. And everybody's in all excited about the music. Hmm, boy, wow, what a part. Wow. Everybody looks to see how many notes he's got. Everyone wants a big part. So, oh, gee. Wow. What, what and, and there's nothing at all like like exercises. You know, it's a fantastic bunch of stuff. All kinds of glissandos, dominiando, all kinds of strange little notes and, and runs. And, and, and there's an incredible looking stuff here. And I'm looking at it. I'm working out with Don. Mr. Dirk says... Uh, we are going to do today, we're first going to run through today, a, uh, just run through it. Now, we know that we're going to have trouble with the music and all that, but we're going to try to sight read it. It's going to be music by a man named Tchaikovsky. Well, now, all I knew about Tchaikovsky was that Freddie Martin was always making records about Tchaikovsky. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I thought it was that kind of stuff with a guy playing the piano, you know. And, and he said, we're going to play Tchaikovsky. Well, now... All of us are so hip now today. We do not recall the first impact of that kind of statement on us. Now, think back on it. Now, all of you are so hip. I mean, you know, uh, we're, we're dealing with electronic music now. But let us consider the impact of Tchaikovsky on the native, which is what I was. Uh, not really. Oh, you too. Let's face it. There was a time, I'm sure, when, when uh, you know, uh, stuff like the Blue Danube would make you puddle up. Well, I am a kid, see, and we're standing back there. There was this girl named Betty Bowen. Betty Bowen was a little fat girl who played also the string bass. And Betty Bowen stood on my left. Ernest Dunker stood on my right. Well, Ernie Dunker was very flip. He was a very hip guy. And uh, Dunker was already experimenting with all kinds of stuff that later bass players carried to much greater perfection. He'd heard a lot of stuff that they were doing in the Krupa band. And he decided to make a few experiments along that line. And you you never heard such bass playing out of <laughs> Oh, wow. He was, it was wild. But but then we had this bunch of kids all lined up. Seeing, and, and it's a hot day and it's summertime. We're in the, we're in the auditorium. And we start to play this piece of music. Well, at first, it was very difficult, because it wasn't like on the mall. It didn't sound at all like El Capitan. Uh, and it was not one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. There were other things going on there. And I would say roughly about 20 minutes into this rehearsal, the orchestra got a very odd coloration about it. It was as though we had walked into a room, a bedroom, or a movie, or something that we shouldn't have seen. And it was affecting us powerfully, and we didn't know why it was. It was as though there was a, a funny force going. And, and I'll, the piece, by the way, happened to be Romeo and Juliet, which, uh, which was, it's loaded. It is loaded. I cannot hear this piece of music today without being in a hot, steamy high school auditorium in summer school in the middle of the afternoon with a bunch of kids and Betty Bowen standing next to me having the first truly traumatic experience of her 14-year life. Betty Bowen, and this whole thing was Arco, you know, it's with the bow, and and it, it was Arco, and there's a couple of pizzicato passages there, and I, I, I'm playing away there, and the first thing I became aware of was Betty is beginning to miss all kinds of notes. And she is crying. Betty is crying. And I look, and Betty is going with that fantastic double B thing. Listen to this stuff. Believe me, this ain't Kay Kaiser. Hold it there. I can't go on. <laughs> well, let me tell you. I'll tell you. We are playing away there. And this stuff is going, da, 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 da. it's funny how quickly you will begin to grasp the nuances of this. I think schmaltz or sentimentality is as much a part of people as their feet. It's truly the natural medium that we work in. We have to fight against that all the time. I don't care how hip you are. You are fighting a losing battle against sentimentality all of your life, what you consider sentimentality. And I suspect that the sentimentality that we're talking about is purely being human. It's, it's, and so naturally we fight against it because we know how rotten humans are. We really do. You know, we all know that basically. And, and there is a sense of loss of control once you become what you are. 
And it goes into many different areas. I know, I know guys, that, oh, it goes into sex, it goes everything else, uh, where, where guys will, where people will literally fight against any kind of true emotion involved, emotion, sentimentality, name it, involving themselves in any given situation that should call for it. Uh, and th- th- they will be honored for it. So I'm standing back there, and, and, and this thing is beginning to come out. And the first thing that Dirks did, now hold it before I give you the cue. Dirks had on the stage a record player, Mr. Dirks. And it was one of these electrical portable things, you know, with a imitation leather. And he set it up on the stage where we were rehearsing. And he said, now I'm going to... I'm going to play this. It's going to. It's, this is being played by the, the Chicago Symphony under Dr. Frederick Stock, and uh, we're going to play this. I want you to listen very carefully. You bass people back there, I want you particularly to notice uh, the way the glissandos are handled. Particularly, I want you to notice. Uh, and then he goes on. The number seven. Now look at number seven on your music, just right after the coda there. I want you to listen to that spot particularly. Well, he plugs this thing in, and we're all sitting there. Remember, our music stands are filled with Sousa. Our music stands are filled with such things as Over the Waves. It's filled with stuff like On the Mall. And he plugs this thing in, turns on this tinny little thing, and it starts to come out. This is real music, you know. And we're sitting there, all the slobs, every one of us a slob to our to the core. Just kids, you know. Mr. Dirk says, now watch. Now watch how they draw this out. Now listen. Uh, and this old fat man is running around the stage, and he is gone. He is no longer teaching a high school band. He said, da, 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 da. easy now, listen. Da, da. And then he would stop. Oh, no, 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 don't let, no, 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 not the next cut. That's one cut only. So he he would uh, he would stop, and we had never seen Mr. Dirks like this. Mr. Dirks, whose only concern was, I remember Dirks' only thing he used to say all the time: "Hey, baseman, will you open your spit valves? Oh, you're gurgling!" And he would say things like, "You trumpets, will you please tone down? Shut up, will you?" That was the, the whole concept that Dirks had. He'd say, I am beating this stick, so you'll march up. One, two, three, four. One, two. Watch me. That was Dirks. And that's all we knew about him. Well, today, Mr. Dirks, and it's a hot, and it was summer school. I remember this is what reminded me of it. It was a hot, stinky, rotten afternoon. We're all trying to get our extra three credits. And we're waiting for the next year. And Dirks with this steam, has plugged in the record player. Well, most of us, you know, don't ever see adults being transported. We see adults in fights. We see adults mad at each other. We see adults once in a while scared, but very rarely when you're a kid. We see adults in almost every conceivable situation, but hardly ever in a state of transport. You know what I mean by transport? It's a great word. Uh, because adults don't really get transported much. That's one of the reasons. It's a rare condition. And when they do get transported, they fight like fiends to try to prevent it from being seen. They really do. Well, here in front of us, and there were a hundred little squirts, Betty Bowen, all of us, all Dunker, the whole crowd, Schwartz, everybody sitting there with the violas. I remember there was a girl named Alice Longnecker. Uh, yes, Alice Longnecker <laughs> played the oboe. <laughs> and I can only tell you that, that, that next to certain passages of Laurel and Hardy, one of the great comedy scenes of my, of, of my life is Alice Longnecker Dealing with Dvorak. Uh, this is a magnificent. You know that long oval passage in the Fifth Symphony? You should have seen Alice deal with that. Alice Longnecker had a certain spread eagle's way of, of sitting when she dealt with that. No, no, it had nothing to do with it. Just the way she, she would, she would move into Dvorak the way certain linebackers I have known moved in on a defensive play. 
Uh, she would, you could just see Alice Long, who, who weighed about 375 pounds, and Alice Longnecker with that oboe sticking out of her looked like a large fruitcake with a toothpick. And she would move into it, you know, <laughs> sweating. Boy, oh boy, you, you don't see girls sweat anymore. This, this girl would sweat, big puddles of sweat, and she was a great oboe player. Yes, she was the only musician in the whole rotten outfit. And Dirks would always pick things where they had these wild oboe passages because we'd be going, you know, we'd be rumble, 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 back there banging away in the timpanies. And all of a sudden, we would come to an oboe passage, and it would start singing out. Duh, duh. And the auditorium, we'd be, playing an, uh, we'd be playing a big concert. The auditorium would stop. Just like in a play when somebody suddenly says the truth. And he's really acting. Everybody's there. There's, the coughing stops instantly. Well, Alice Longnecker used to go with that with that oboe, and it would go on and on and on. She was fantastic, little old fat slobby Alice Longnecker, and and she would buck down. She really bucked into it. She'd sit down in her seat low, her feet out in front of her, <laughs> really seriously. And sweat, oh, her concentration was fantastic. It would squirt out of her ears. And she holds that oboe, you know, like, like, like Roger Maris holds a bat. You know, she was born to this crummy thing. She'd hold on to this thing, and then it would come, and Dirks would stop as though he's just throwing the rest of us out. Old Kleenex, you know, all right, we got this jazz out, all right. And Dirks would take his time. Da, da, and he's singing. And Dirks and Longnecker would have this duet. It was a beautiful thing to behold. But that was later. Now we are having our first, our first taste of transport. Dirks looked like Zero Mostel to begin with. Except that he looked like an uninspired Zero Mostel. You all automatically think of Zero Mostel with a look in the eye. No. Dirks was a, was a big fat man who wore gray suits and had a bald head and looked very tired, and always looked as though he were melting, kind of. You know, that kind of fatness. He would sort of drift down into his his suits and stuff, and everything sort of hung on him. And and all I, I found in my experience that almost later, I've, I know it now, that almost all people who teach music are guys who had, at one point in their life, some faint glimmering of something else. And what it was, was unattainable, completely, thoroughly, and utterly. I don't know what a guy ordinarily who, who, who say, is directing uh, uh, the Circleville band uh, in high school, what does he do when he sees on television, say, uh, Sir Thomas Beecham? Does he have a sense of rapport with him? Does he have a sense of envy? Or does he sit there and nod his head and say, yeah, I know, old man. I know. Tell him. Which does he have? I, I suspect he might have all three or maybe four or five things going. And it's hard for him to say anything to people in the neighborhood. Well, this afternoon, out of the clear blue sky, dark, oh, hot, that Midwestern heat hanging down. We're in the auditorium, and it smells like old seats. It smells like old auditorium sessions. You know, all those speeches by the principal are still hanging up there in, that, in the cupies up in there in the, in the ceiling and the old purple curtains hanging back and a great big sign says ham and high. And our, we had purple and white was our color, the world's worst colors. If you can imagine a purple and white curtain nine years past its prime. Well, it hung. And then everything, it smelled. You know, you got old props and tennis shoes that were hidden under the stage and dead mice and school. You know what I'm talking about? Somewhere far off, an old swimming pool was festering. Some place you could smell the track and the gym shows and the jock show, or the whole business, you know. It was all there, see. And we're sitting on the stage. We're, we're, what we want, you see, is our three credit hours. We're sitting there. And Dirks comes in with a record. And he says, now... I'm going to play this record, and I'm going to play it so that you children will hear how this is played. You never call us children. I must uh, have to amend that right away. Because he always treated us as if we were musicians, you know. <laughs> Again, part of his fantasy. And he was treating us like he was up there, you know, and they were rehearsing for a Grant Park concert. It was a Chicago symphony. He says, all right, now, I want you to hear how they do this. This is the Chicago symphony under Dr. Stock. Uh, now, I, I don't exactly agree with Mr. Stock on certain things that he does in this. And I, 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 when we, when we actually work on it ourselves, 
uh, there will be certain things that will not be the same as on this record. Oh, boy. Was he understating the case? <laughs> I later heard how we played it. But he says, there will be certain things. He says, but I want you to notice the flow. I want you to notice, among other things, I want you to notice the continuity of the play. You bass players particularly, you're playing from, from, you're playing from measure to measure. You're not playing measures, you're playing music. What does this mean? A kid who's struggling from B flat to C natural, all he does is read the notes, fighting like mad, it's, it's a losing battle all the way, you know, playing the piece, we don't know about this. And in that dust, he plugs this thing in, and he turns it on. It sounded rotten at first. You're playing the wrong cut, Dad. Good heavens, Mary Marlin. <laughs> See the problem? <laughs> That's all right. It's, 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 uh, it's Romeo and Juliet. Don't bring that in because it has nothing whatsoever to do with the situation. But he starts to play this thing. Listen to this now. Just, I, I want you to listen to it for a second. I don't care how hip you are, just listen to it for a second. Listen to that oboe working in it. Hear that? You see what he means by flow? No, they take a deep breath. <sighs> now, at this point, at this point, I want you to notice particularly the horns. Just set that back one line, just one groove, maybe two. The horns come in and begin to make a few vaguely snide comments. Now, listen. Hear wow, wow. Hear them? Well, there was a guy named Howard Steffi who played first horn. Steffi was a typical kid. He hated music. He hated doing everything. He was looking for his three credit hours and the fact that if you were in the band, you got in the football games free. He was a real, a real, <laughs> the great line from. Well, Mr. Dirks stopped the record at that point. And he said, Howard, oh, oh another thing that Howard had, which always maddens people when, when you see that kind of a wise, you know, he had natural ability, but had absolutely no, no, no respect for it. He didn't give a darn. He didn't give a damn at all about it. It's like, it's like meeting somebody who can write like a fiend and they don't do it. You know? <laughs> They don't care. I read it. I read it. It's like somebody who can run a hundred yards in nine point five, and he he doesn't do anything. He sits around and eats bananas and that kind of stuff. Right? Somehow that makes you madder than guys who do it. I don't know why. Well, Stuffy was sitting there, and Mister Dirk stopped, and he said, "Howard, I want you to listen to the horn there." And Howard starts to listen. Play it in there. I'll show you what he was listening to. Howard sits. Hear those horns going in there? Hear that? Well, well, Howard, Howard looked at Dirks and he says, play that again. And Dirks sent it back and played it again. But obviously, Steffi had never heard anything this side of Glenn Miller at that point, you know? And he says, is that on this music? And the guy takes his music and he starts to look at the music. And Steffi had suddenly discovered the horn. <laughs> he has discovered the horn. He says, where is it? And so Dirk says, well, it's at there at number seven there, right past the coda. Now, 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 here, I'll play it. He sets it back and, and Steffi is watching the notes. He is watching the notes and counting them off. And the music is playing. And, and Dirks is saying, now see, B flat, B flat, B flat, C, G, uh, A natural C. Uh, and Steffi's saying, yeah, 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 hold it, yeah, yeah. And Steffi picks up his horn and starts to play it. Well, Dirks was running around that stage, 
talking to everybody in every section, pointing out what... Now, look, 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 look. Now, I'll point out one thing. That's when the sheep began to be separated from the goats. Three quarters of the, of the kids thought Dirks had, had flipped his lid. One tenth of the kids got what Dirks was talking about, but couldn't make the scene. And I would say about one, maybe two kids out of that whole crowd not only got what Dirk said, but were changed forever. Do you know that Steffi went on to become one of the best horn players in the country? How's that? And I saw it happen. And, and he said, no, no, wow, he couldn't believe that that came out. And he started to play it, and he blew it. He really blew it for the first time, and it really sang. And, and you know, kids are natural. They don't know, you know. He didn't know that it's a hard horn to play. He didn't know that, that his lip was going to go bad. He didn't know it's going to cause high blood pressure and all the rest. But all he knew is it was great. Well, we started to play that afternoon, and I'm standing back in the bass section, and I'm playing this thing, and I'm going away. And it's, oh, listen to the bass section in this thing. The bass, they have, I, I, I can see the notes in my mind. Listen carefully. Bring it up now. Hear the bass? Long note. Diminuendo out. Up. The basses are playing the melody now. Listen. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, I had a sense of power that I cannot describe even now. Dirks is up there, and his eyes are puddling up. He is directing Tchaikovsky. Betty Bowen is next to me, crying like she's out of her skull. And I, I, I it, was, it was wild. You know, have you ever stood behind an instrument and found that the instrument was literally playing itself? And the way you were playing it was making you cry? <laughs> Now, how can you explain that? I can't explain it, except that those who have done it know it. I have known writers who have sat down and have written a passage and have been broken up by it. They cry, look at that, oh, and they weep because it was their typewriter playing. So, yeah, somewhere along the line, the amalgam between this, this thing this guy's got, this, this pen or this, 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 Musical instrument, this this piece of this mystique, whatever music is and whatever it all all amounts to, sweeps you away until there's no place to go. And you stand back there, and you're and of course we sounded terrible. I must tell you this, we sounded awful. But it wasn't that. That isn't the point. The point is we had tasted a heady brew that was so heady that there was never ever any going back. Never ever going back. Now now. What happened to all of us, of course, is dependent on later life. But I'll tell you a thing that happened along uh, along this, this particular line, uh, in connection with this kind of with this kind of thing, this sort of uh, strange moment in time. I I uh, I've long since, of course, gotten very hip about music. I've learned a lot of things about music. Uh, I, th- I think sometimes learning often, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's, whether it's learning about, uh, when you start to learn about passion, you're in trouble. I suppose you can put it that way. When you start to intellectualize passion, and music is passion, no matter how much you, you slice music, it is not, it is not intellectual. There's no such thing as intellectual music. Absolutely no such thing. Uh, there is not one single idea that comes out of music, and that, after all, is what intellectualism means. There is uh, is highly complex music, I agree. There is uh, esoteric music. There is uh, music of an experimental nature, but no, I think the very nature of music itself is, per se, passion, pure and simple. Because, after all, hearing is purely a physical function. It's like, is taste intellectual? Is it? A lot of people will tell you it is. Because they happen to enjoy a certain kind of snail. Oh no. No, it's a passion. It's, it's, it's one of the basic passions. Uh, is music? I don't know. Well, I, 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 it's been a long time, see, and one night, it's funny business. I'm in Germany. 
a very strange place to be at three or four o'clock in the morning, all by myself. It was a couple of years ago. And there are certain countries in which you really feel foreign. Germany is one, particularly, uh, at least I do. In certain areas of Germany, you really feel, you really feel like you're in a foreign country and you really feel alone. There's, there's, there's not a great deal of contact you can make under, under certain circumstances. And I'm sitting in a little place in Bavaria, an inn on a lake. Now, b- b- people in, in, in spas, uh, this is Marion Badsville. She saw the movie, that kind of thing. And down, down the end of the, the little roadway is the gambling casino. And in the gambling casino are, well, the Marion Bad people. We don't have them in America. It doesn't fit. It's not, it's not Las Vegas, believe me. It's not Frank Sinatra and the pack. Something very different. It's like people who've been ten, through 10,000 wars. They've been through thousands of, of, uh, of things which none of us can even understand yet in America. And they're way down at the end of the street. And I can hear the sound of the, of the roulette wheel going. Completely foreign. I can hear these people talking in foreign tongues. And I'm sitting in my little room there. And down below me, about three stories below, is this crummy little five-piece orchestra. And they're playing. And they're playing for dinner, which is down below, which goes on forever in a spa. Dinner is always. Always fine wines and fine cheeses and fine women. And these guys are playing Romeo and Juliet. And they're playing it almost as badly as we were playing it in high school. Because there's only four moth-eaten musicians. One guy with a fiddle, one guy with a viola, another guy with a set of drums, and somebody playing a bass. And this music is coming up through the air shaft and floating around, and I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden I'm back at Hammond High. I'm back at this rotten, terrible gym, this auditorium. And I can, I, 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 the sweat and the smoke and the, and the, and the stockyards, and poor old Dirks pirouetting around the stage there, looking at us, trying to get it out of us. Not out of us, really, in a sense. I suspect that what he was doing was saying, join my dream. Join mine. Come. Come. We will all be. We will all be the New York Philharmonic. I will be Toscanini. Come. We will all dream.